So in this lecture, this is an introduction to human movement, and this really makes up the bulk of the first exam. This lecture used to be tied in with the, the functional anatomy as well, and just became too complex. So this is chapter four of the textbook. I know it's a few chapters ahead, and it is mostly chapter four. Um, and we're going to look at some of the basic concepts, and then this is going to set the tone for the other um, aspects we're going to do within this module, particularly the movement assessment. And then when we look into the next aspect of what muscles, or at least the muscle function that's happening within these movements that we're assessing. So we're going to look at some of the terms that are related to um, biomechanics and looking at functional anatomy. Uh, the big aspect is going to be the planes of motion. We're going to look at joint actions. We're going to introduce muscle actions. And then uh, I have other videos that talk in detail lever systems and this base of support and the center of gravity. So when we look at this particular aspect, we're taking biomechanics, we're taking physics, looking at external forces, usually gravity internal forces, muscle tension, and we're applying it to kinesiology, which is human movement. And we introduce this concept of the human movement system, which is the nervous system, muscular system, skeletal system, and the support systems. So this used to be one big module, and I split it. So we have biomechanics and human movement, the first one, and then we look into the actual anatomical physiology into the next module. So the first thing we look at is how do we describe movement? How do we actually tell people what to do? We usually use terms like flex your muscle or bend your arm or stand straight. Why is it important? And it, when we're in class, we usually set up, we get someone and we blindfold them and uh, we have them blind, to, we don't blindfold them, but we would blind them to this image and we have the class try to get them to achieve this position. And they'll say like, lift your arm a little bit more, a little bit less, turn your hand in or out. And they'll use, try to use common terminology or vernacular and it doesn't go so well. It eventually happens, but not as fast as it, as it could. And in this particular case, he's abducting his arm 90 degrees, externally rotating 90 degrees, bending his elbow 90 degrees, and supinating at the wrist about 45 degrees. So if you talk to anyone that's somewhat versed in anatomy or physiology, they'll be able to achieve that within seconds. So this conversation, this terms that we're using isn't to sound smart or sound intelligent. It's just part of the vernacular for us to describe human movement. We look at this position too, and we say there's about 30 or 40 degrees of knee flexion, 90 degrees of hip flexion, 180 degrees of shoulder flexion, neutral through the wrists. And again, it's just ways for us to describe human movement. So we can look at exercise and so we can analyze, we look at athletic performance. This is a picture perfect sprinting a position right off the blocks and um, we're looking at the joint actions here and if we this is if this is the ideal that we want to achieve and we want our clients to achieve and it can be a complex task like sprinting or a simple task like a barbell um, bench press or a barbell um, bicep curl so in order to um, describe movement we have to have a reference point and this reference point is the anatomical position and the, the next four bullets there just talk about what it is, but I'm just going to show you. And this is the anatomical position. It is feet together, straight, uh, erect through the spine, palms presented forward, and that is it. Now, unfortunately, there is we never get in this position unless we're talking about anatomical position. But this is the position that you see most of your muscle charts, cadavers, uh, anatomical aspect. But it it, it helps to coordinate uh, or to uh, streamline communication, but it's not the position that we'll ever start exercise in or do things in. In this chapter two, you get into this concept of directional terms. Again, more terminology. Um, these are things that are just straight up memorization. Uh, looking at, instead of saying higher, lower, or front, back, or left, right, you're using terms like medial, lateral, anterior, posterior. What we're really looking at uh, where we get into we start with the movement analysis is looking at the planes of the body. We operate in three dimensions of space, right? And uh, this is sometimes a problem for students is first, they're trying to learn all this terminology. And then secondly, they're trying to go from a two dimensional page to a three dimensional um, coordinate system. And we divide the body into um, sagittal plane, frontal plane, and transverse plane. And this creates this three-dimensional coordinate system. So we're going from this anatomical position that you see on the left to this three-dimensional space that we see on the right. And we do this not only to 
to categorize and organize the movements that we see, but it also helps us start to analyze what muscles and what tissues are involved in those particular movements. So we have the sagittal plane that divides the body in the left and right halves, and then we have a frontal or medial lateral axis that, that is perpendicular to this. It's like a pin going right through the paper. And what that pin or that bar represents is the spinning aspect, the axis of rotation that all movement occurs in that sagittal plane. We have the frontal plane with the sagittal axis or the anterior posterior axis, and that divides the body into front and back halves. And then we finally have the transverse plane that has a vertical or the superior inferior axis. Now, I've mentioned different terms for these different planes and different textbooks and different websites use different aspects, but they're all interchangeable. So the frontal plane and the coronal plane are the same. Transverse plane and horizontal plane are the same. The medial lateral axis and the frontal axis are the same. So just be aware of that if you're referencing other resources. So this shows the sagittal plane and it shows this bar right here, this is the bar, this is the medial lateral axis, but now it shows it from a just a pure right side perspective, and that's that bar right there. There's that bar right there, there's that bar right there, and what this is representing is the pin that's going through the joint and the joint motions that are available in the sagittal plane. So we're looking at extension at the shoulder, at the hip, at the knee, and then we're looking in the opposite direction, same plane, same axis, now it's flexion of the shoulder, flexion of the hip, and flexion of the knee. And as we'll talk about in a later slide, um, human movement is rotation. So there's a fixed axis rotation, and there's some rotation rotating around that fixed segment. So this is the frontal plane, and you can see the axis of rotation there at the shoulders and the hips, and then you can see uh, abduction happening at the shoulders and the hips. And then you have the transverse plane or the horizontal plane. Um, you can't see it because it's right there, but if we tilt it, if we were to tilt this image down, you'd be able to see this plane right here. So when we look at the movements that occur there and the axis of rotation, here are the planes, these are the axes, and those are the movements that occur within those planes. And that's how we start to describe human movement. We do have movement that occurs also in the um, trunk and spine, flexion, extension, lateral flexion, rotation, and I have another video that goes into more detail with that. So when we look at joint movement, this is also this is often described by the spatial movement pattern in relation to the body. And so when we look at the coordinate system, this moves with the body. So if I if I am here and I lay down on my back, this coordinate system comes with me. So it's this coordinate system isn't fixed to the world, it's fixed, it's relative to the body. It actually is relative to each particular joint. So I can bring my arm up over my head and this whole coordinate system comes along with it. It always comes back to this anatomical position, but if let's say he lays down on his back and he does now a bench press, he would not be bench pressing in the frontal plane, he would still be bench pressing in the transverse plane. Even though you're spotting him behind him and like holding up the bar, his frontal plane, his transverse plane now is in line with your frontal plane. So it's not a fixed aspect like gravity is always down or the, the horizon is always out in front of us. This is a relative to the individual body, individual athlete, and the individual body segment. And then when we describe movement, uh, particularly exercises, we're looking at the plane of movement that's occurring. Which direction? Is it going forward, back, side to side? And then we're using the appropriate term like flexion, abduction, internal rotation. You're getting the joint action from that direction. And then the next aspect that we look at, if we start looking at muscle participation, which becomes a level of complexity. So when we look at the sagittal plane, um, we have two descriptive terms available to us. We have flexion or extension. Flexion is the decrease in angle between two segments. Extension is the increase in angle of those two segments. You have frontal plane, which is uh, where you have abduction, where you're moving away from midline. So if you abduct someone, you take something away. Or if you add, adduct, add to something, you're going towards midline. And then when we look at the spine, the spine can't move towards or away from midline because the spine is considered midline in most cases. Um, we refer to that as lateral flexion. And then in a transverse plane, you have movements of internal, sometimes referred to as medial rotation. You have external, sometimes referred to as lateral rotation. Internal is moving in towards midline. External is turning out away from midline. 
And then in the trunk and spine, um, the midline is the spine. You're either turning to your left or turning to your right. There's a few special considerations uh, in the um, these different planes. So for when we look at the wrist, we introduce these, con these terms of supination and pronation. And this becomes confusing because the wrist supinates and pronates, and so does the the terms used to describe the foot, which are nothing to do with the pronation supination of the wrist. And it's also a way to look at kinetic chain assessment through triplanar motion of a joint of supination and pronation. So yes, I didn't write the rules. It is confusing, but just be aware of that, that supination and pronation are used three different ways in anatomy. In this particular lecture for this particular example, we're talking about wrist supination, which is what you see on the right where you're presenting your palm or like how you would hold a bowl of soup if your elbow was bent, and then pronation, how you would pour that soup into the person's lap that decided to use pronation and supination three times in anatomy and physiology. You also at the wrist have these weird aspects of ulnar deviation and radial deviation. And most people would say that ulnar deviation is wrist adduction, adduction towards midline, and mo others would say, and the radial deviation is 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 abduction, abduction, but it does not follow suit with our biomechanical assessment. So it's not correct, um, and so that's why we don't use ulnar adduction or wrist adduction or abduction. We typically use ulnar deviation and radial deviation. If you used wrist adduction and wrist abduction, um, you would get a different things from different people. But if you use ulnar deviation and radial deviation, are you bending towards the ulnar side, which is your pinky side, or are you bending towards your radial side, the radial side, you'll have 100% congruency. The reason why this is an issue is because we have this silly anatomical position that you see on the right here with these palms faced out. In normal resting position, you're in this position here. So then in this case, radial deviation would actually be now, would that be wrist flexion and then extension? So it gets confusing. That's why we use radial deviation and ulnar deviation. Another confusing aspect is ankle movement. And remember the definition of flexion are two segments coming closer together. And in this case, we have dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. Um, this is dorsiflexion here on the left. And if you look at some of the textbooks, about 75% will have them correct by labeling this as ankle extension. And then 25% would have them incorrect by calling this ankle flexion. And then plantar flexion, it's just the opposite. This is actually ankle flexion because what's happening is when you're doing this, you don't look at the foot, you're looking at the heel and the heel is actually moving away. So you're getting extension here and here it's moving closer. Again, way too complex to figure out. So instead, if the plantar surface, the plant like the bottom of the foot or you plant into the ground, if that's moving closer to the calf or the shin, that's plantar flexion. Or if the dorsal surface, like the dorsal fin of a shark, the top of the foot, if that's moving closer to the shin, it's dorsal flexion. So it makes it a lot easier than trying to figure out is it extension, flexion, having a debate, and so forth. You have ankle, or you have foot inversion, eversion. This is actually happening at the subtalar joint below the ankle. So the inversion is the bottom of the foot facing in, or eversion is the bottom of the foot facing out. These are both examples of the right leg. And um, so this, the right side is doing inversion, and then another image of the right leg doing eversion. The last special consideration is probably the most complex, but we'll deal with this when you get into a functional anatomy class. But just realize that the scapula itself isn't a true joint. The joint itself actually comes from the clavicle in the front. And so the scapula is involved in quite a bit of movements, but these aren't your typical flexion, extension, ab and abduction. So we refer to um, the movements here at, in these six uh, three degrees or six uh, different movements. You have protraction, retraction. So if you give yourself a hug, that's protraction. If you extend, expand your chest, like you're going to chest bump someone, that's retraction. If you shrug your shoulders, like in the bottom left-hand side there, that's elevation. And if you depress your shoulders, that is uh, depression. And then if you lift your arms up to the side, your scapula are going to flare up, upward rotation. And if you bring your hands back and down, like a lat pull down, that's going to be downward rotation. The reality is all three of these are happening at the same time. They're not happening in isolation. When you elevate, you're also doing some protraction and upward rotation. When you retract, you're doing a little bit of depression and downward rotation. 
we try to isolate these for descriptive aspects, but in real life, these are all happening together. And then the last two things, um, you have this concept of triplanar motion. And triplanar motion is movement in all three planes. And that typically happens when you're looking at supination or pronation through uh, the hip or shoulder or foot or so forth. Um, sometimes it can be referred to this aspect of circumduction, which is like a conical shape that's made by making a circle with the distal segment. This can only be done at the fingers, the, the hands, and the, arm, the legs, and you're making this circle aspect. Um, the other thing that gets into triplanar motion is movement through all three planes, or in another word of saying it, movement that's happening outside of one of these cardinal planes. So we look at these planes here. We have the sagittal plane, the frontal plane, and the transverse plane. And these can be these can happen right through the center of the body, or this can be offset a little bit. So we can take different sagittal sections of the hand, the wrist, and this moves from joint to joint as we move. Remember, it's relative to the body and to the body segment. Same thing happens with the frontal plane. You can be right in the midline, right through the center, like this is depicting here, or you can have just one frontal slice. Same thing with the transverse plane. What you see here, and it's also depicted right here, is what's called the oblique plane. This is where most of your life happens, is the oblique plane. Remember, we use the sagittal, frontal, and transverse plane to help coordinate, but in reality, you're not really moving just in the sagittal plane. You're also moving in the transverse plane and frontal plane. Just think of a bench press. When you do a bench press, you can either take a wide grip bench press, which would force you into the transverse plane here, or you can take a narrow grip bench press, and that will force you into the sagittal plane here. But you probably take something in between, and you're more at an angle like this. You're somewhere between the sagittal plane and the transverse plane. And you, your body found the most biomechanical advantageous position for you to go in, which is the best line of pull. So just keep in mind that we use these as descriptive points as references, but we're not stuck within these planes. So when we look at these three-dimensional coordinate system, and I have these images in the blackboard shell, everything you see on the screen right now, this is everything the human body can do everything that we're analyzing outside of fine movements of the feet and the hands and the, and the jaw. But for gross movement, like running, throwing, sports activities, um, this is it. And from these isolated movements, these three, and this all comes from three planes, three axes of rotation, and then your descriptive terms of six of flexion, extension, ab, and abduction, um, this is how we're able to do the majority of movements that we do. So everything here can be described descriptive in terms of flexion, extension, ab and abduction, frontal plane, sagittal plane.